turn now to the eurozone, if I may, and currencies, which is uh, something where you're, uh, you're certainly very knowledgeable. Uh, many commentators have been raising concerns about the health of the eurozone, um, the stability of the euro currency, the debts of certain countries such as Italy, uh, as well as their vulnerability to the, the current situation after uh, Putin's invasion of uh, Ukraine in relation to gas, oil and coal and the shortage thereof, it, it, which could damage their economies in the Eurozone quite critically and also within the EU. So I, I'm, I'd like to know what, what your thoughts are on the Eurozone as a whole, first of all, and then how you see the threats to, to the Eurozone. I, I wish the Eurozone well, because they are our neighbours. They've chosen to have a uh, common single currency as an important part of their forward economic policy. And it's in our interests that it is changed and improved in a way which promotes greater employment and greater prosperity on the continent, because it hasn't always been helpful to them. And my advice to them it is very straightforward, that in order to make a single currency work successfully, you need pretty big transfers from the richer parts of the currency zone to the poorer parts of the currency zone. And I think one of the things which has delayed full success for the euro is um, a, a German reluctance in particular to share enough of the money around the, the, the euro zone um, through, through grants and tax transfers in the way that happens within the sterling currency zone or the dollar currency zone in the UK or the US, where there are enormous transfers going on the whole time uh, through local government grant settlements, through regional policies, through common national welfare policies on a currency-wide basis. And you don't have anything like those same big transfer policies within the Eurozone. So what they've come up with, which is really a part-time short-term measure, uh, is a system called Target 2 Balances. And so what happens is Germany and the other surplus countries uh, deposit uh, their surpluses in the European Central Bank. And they have been getting zero interest on that over recent years. And then the deficit countries like Italy, Greece, Portugal and Spain draw down from the European Central Bank and they've been borrowing at zero interest. Uh, so it's been like getting a grant, only technically it is a loan, technically at some point in the future they would need to repay it. And that's kept the Eurozone relatively liquid and very stable. Now they're beginning to raise interest rates, they're up against this fundamental problem of how do you transfer enough money uh, from surplus to deficit countries, and that is the main preoccupation of the European Central Bank, and they're working a scheme out in order to try and keep the interest rates in uh, Spain, Italy, Greece, Portugal and the others lower to carry on buying up the bonds, the state debt of those countries, to but keep the, the cost of the state debt down. Now this isn't really the best way of doing it, I think it's um, a poor substitute for actually having enough transfer payments around the zone so that those deficit countries don't need to borrow so much in the first place. It, it is otherwise a bit unstable to, to have the, the poorer countries not getting enough access to the profits and incomes generated in the uh, more successful parts of the zone economically and therefore having to borrow a lot and then say, well, we need to have some special fix to keep the borrowing costs down. Because it was that very issue, of course, which caused the euro crises of a decade ago, uh, when the um, surplus countries said they weren't going to stand behind all of the Greek debt and all of the Cypriot banking debt, uh, and that they were made to make very painful decisions. And you had a period when, if you deposited euros in, in a Greek or Cypriot bank account, there were difficulties in getting your money back. Uh, because the system wasn't liquid enough, whereas in a normal uh, national single currency zone, there's never any question of somebody in town A not being able to get money out of their bank because it's in deficit compared with town B, which is in surplus, the money just transfers automatically. Let me just ask about Italy. Italy is the uh, <clears throat> third largest economy now in the EU, now that the UK has left. Um, and th there are some serious problems there. Do, do you have any concerns about that? 
Well, of course, we, we all are worried for Italy because Italy is the, the largest independent state debtor within the total system and is having to draw down massively on the European Central Bank monies. And that is why what I've just been talking about is very crucial. So either there has to be a way that Italy can borrow very cheaply through the guarantee of the zone, which is what's happening at the moment, effectively, or there needs to be a better transfer system so that the deficit countries like Italy can get more money from the, the richer countries. But that is something which Germany still seems uh, reluctant to accept. But that's what you're going to need to have a smooth single currency. And meanwhile, it's causing political tensions in Italy. So we've seen the collapse of the government recently. And um, we see that the polling shows that more Eurosceptic parties, the, the three right of centre parties, uh, are looking a bit more popular. So we'll have to see how that develops, because it, it could mean that there's a, a rather stronger rhetoric against some elements of the Euro scheme coming out of Italy in the next few weeks. Mm. John, on energy, uh, this is now affecting people right across Europe. Uh, what are your views? The European energy system uh, is very badly damaged by the Russian invasion of Ukraine and by its very strong dependence on imported Russian gas. And it looks as if we've got a difficult winter coming up on the continent with particular pressures on Russia and Germany, uh, on, sorry, on Germany and Italy, uh, who are very dependent on Russian imported gas. Uh, we've seen Putin playing games over the summer by cutting back quite severely on the amount of gas supplied through Nord Stream 1 pipe and also some reductions in other pipeline gas through the other three main pipes into Western Europe. And we've seen them at one point close the Nord Stream 1 pipeline completely for, for maintenance, just to show Europe uh, that uh, they are very beholden to him for, for the gas supplies. At the same time as um, Germany, Italy and others will want to reduce their dependence on Russian gas and, and will find um, Russia not a reliable supplier. Uh, we have German Greens in the coalition still insisting on the closure of the remaining German nuclear power stations, which is not helpful. Uh, a debate going on in Germany about whether they should prolong their lives for a bit. It would be helpful if they could. And in France, which has been very successful in recent years by having a lot of its own nuclear power, which has helped keep the cost of total power down, uh, France is discovering that she's got an aging fleet, uh, that there have been increasing number of maintenance problems, temporarily closing substantial chunks of capacity, and this summer a shortage of water um, used in cooling systems has also been causing some disruption. So it's been a a perfect storm and it's been an even more perfect storm when the wind doesn't blow because there's increasing dependence on wind power for electricity. So Europe, uh, led by Germany, needs to change its energy policies as quickly as it can and in the meantime it looks as if um, against their net zero ambitions they're going to go for more coal uh, because coal is relatively easy to access and they still have some ways of burning the coal or converting the coal in, into energy uh, they can use. When we come to the UK, uh, we're not in such a weak position. Uh, we do still produce half the gas we need. Uh, I'm one of those who's been urging for some time uh, that we improve our approach to those who could get oil and gas out of the North Sea and increase our short-term and medium-term output as much as we can to help. So, so you're definitely in favour of increasing natural gas from the North Sea? Yes, of course. And I've been one of the leaders yes. of that campaign and many more people now agree. Uh, those who feel most passionately about net zero uh, have a good reason to agree because if we burn gas we produce from the North Sea ourselves instead of burning LNG gas imported through tanker, we produce less CO2 in the process. <laughs> Uh, as well as helping ease the international tensions and international scarcities and helping to keep the price down a little bit from these very elevated levels we're experiencing. So in the UK, it's very important we, we maximise this decade our output of oil and gas while we see how the transition develops towards uh, an electricity-based energy system uh, dependent much more on renewables. But this decade, we're going to need all the oil and gas we can get given the global shortage. 
And then the, the bulk of the rest of our gas comes from um, Norway and Qatar uh, mm. under reasonably reliable contracts, we hope. And so that puts us in a bit better position. But I remain worried about our electricity generating capacity. Given the ambitions the government and others have that many more of us should turn to electric heating and to electric vehicles, we're mighty short of capacity were that movement to take off. So far, we're keeping the lights on because not many people are buying electric cars and very few people are buying heat pumps. So that would change quite quickly if those products took off. And we're also discovering that uh, our increasing reliance on wind power gives us problems because whilst we may get 30 or 40% of our electricity from wind on a good day, on a bad day for wind, we might get 1% of our electricity from wind. So we still need plenty of backup ways of generating power until um, a commercial way is discovered and rolled out for storing all that wind power. Now, there are ways of doing that. I mean, it, it could be that hydrogen conversion from uh, green electricity is, is the way to go, but that, that's going to take quite a lot of time and a lot of money to and put in a hydrogen-based yeah. system. Or it could be big batteries uh, provide some of the answer, but again, it still takes time to uh, put in the investment and to get batteries that uh, keep enough of the energy without wasting and losing too much in, in the process of recharging the batteries and then sending the power out okay. from the batteries. So until we get there, uh, I'm very keen that we keep open what capacity we've got to provide alternative methods of generating electricity on cold days when the wind doesn't blow. What are your views on uh, the housing crisis? What can we do? Well, I think the first thing we need to do is to review again the number of people we invite in to, to live permanently and work in our country. Um, we are taking control of our borders. It's proving complex and difficult. Uh, particularly when it comes to illegal crossings where more action is going to be taken. Uh, but the bulk of people come in perfectly legally at our invitation and I think we need to um, reduce the numbers we're inviting in to, to fill jobs in our country. We have plenty of people at the moment uh, still on benefit who might welcome a job or who might be persuaded that they'd be better off in a job and that they could do a job. So all the time we've got this very strong job position, I would like to see uh, some reduction in, in total net legal migration, and that will reduce some of the pressure on housing. Because if we invite in a quarter of a million additional people every year to, to live and work here, uh, that's an awful lot of houses we need to build and supply in, in order just to keep up with that, uh, as well as obviously having demands for the existing settled population who already live here. I think we need to look again at uh, the, the way in which this is all financed um, and the way in which it is all taxed. It seems to me we're um, making it dearer for people to buy homes in the more expensive parts of the country by the current level of stamp duties, so we could, we could look at that. Uh, and we need to look at um, the availability of uh, new housing. What seems to have happened there is that there are plenty of planning permissions granted, uh, but the industry is finding it difficult uh, to build those out at the pace that people would like. So we need to talk to the industry about what is needed uh, to increase the build against existing permissions. Uh, what we don't want to do is to encourage this very profitable game that some people are playing, uh, that they say there are reasons why they can't build out the permissions that are already existing. Uh, and so they want new permissions for new greenfield sites, which they think would be easier. And they're basically making money out of the planning permissions being granted rather than making money out of uh, doing the hard work of building the houses. So I think we need to stop that gaming of the system uh, in order to uh, concentrate on more output of housing against existing planning applications that are being granted. Yeah. And the, the whole situation with immigration, I mean, this is something that the Conservative Party stood on in 2019, as did you with the manifesto. Uh, and it, you know, I think it's, it's fair to say that it hasn't gone particularly well. Uh, do you have any thoughts on, on the government's current plans, uh, Rwanda, that sort of thing? Uh, what, what are your views on trying to uh, control immigration? 
Well, illegal immigration, which is not the biggest part of it, uh, uh, may need further legal change. Um, if the courts still are trying to thwart the wishes of the government, we've had government ministers who've been very clear that they wish to stop the evil trade, particularly across the channel. Uh, and they pointed out the dangers to the individuals and the profit making by, by those organizing the trade. And um, we need uh, redoubled efforts, I think, of finding out who these people are and getting them arrested and prosecuted. Uh, and we need to look again at the legal framework to see uh, if we can create a, a, a more lawyer proof system because we seem to have quite a lot of lawyers who, who act for uh, those who wish to make a legal entry which complicates the position but I would concentrate as well on uh, legal entry and, and we want to welcome people of talent and people with good reason to come uh, but I think we've overall been welcoming too many people particularly into lower paid jobs and that is where uh, across government redoubled efforts on training, encouragement, the right kind of incentives uh, could find many people who uh, are not working long hours or don't have a job at all, uh, who would be happy and willing to do those jobs, uh, which is a, a double win because we don't then have the additional costs of housing and other provision for new people coming in. Uh, and we will save a bit on the benefit bill because people will be better off because they'll have some income from employment. So that's what I think we need to work away. It's not easy. It requires an awful lot of detailed decisions in different government departments, but it, it should be a whole of government task. OK, uh, we've covered a lot of areas and we're, we're running very short on time now. Uh, I want to ask you just finally about defence. Uh, I know it's not your specialist area of expertise, but I have heard you talk about this before. Uh, Liz Truss, uh, as a potential new Prime Minister, has certainly talked about increasing the defence budget. What are your views? I think we will need to increase the defence budget, but I'm not one of those who says, let's set an arbitrary target of such a percentage GDP. Of course, we have to meet the 2% NATO target, which we, we now do. Uh, but I wouldn't say let's set a target of 3%. Um, I'm saying uh, that we need more defence capability. That is pretty obvious. This is a very uncertain world. Uh, our armed forces are very stretched. There are new NATO commitments in Eastern Europe as a result of increased Russian aggression. Uh, there are new naval commitments with our American allies, given the Chinese challenges uh, in the Pacific area. Uh, and we need to make sure we've got the right equipment and the right personnel to, to meet those increased policing roles that we have worldwide uh, as a result of our, our position in the UN and NATO. So I, I would start with what are the extra capabilities, what are the extra personnel we actually need, and then put a price on those. Because I think on the other side of the equation, as everyone in the debate would agree, we have to get better at buying defence equipment because we, we have quite a long history uh, of um, defence procurement of even a, a relatively straightforward army vehicle taking years longer than it should do, not working very well and having a very large budget overrun. And so we need to get better at specifying, sticking to our specification, making it sure something industry can make relatively easily and then buying it in sufficient quantities so that the unit cost is realistic. Because mm. we are not properly defended as a nation uh, if we cannot make uh, the necessary weapons uh, and supply the necessary ammunition here in the event of a nasty war breaking out. And we've just seen with the Ukraine war how quickly the Ukrainian forces have got through the, the ammunition and weaponry that we and other NATO countries have been able to supply them. And there's now a move to step up the production uh, of those necessities of war. And it's showing that we, we need flexibility. So we, we need to control the technology of the weaponry and ammunition in the UK. We need to have a big enough stockpile of the crucial ingredients. And we need to be able to scale up the manufacturing capability should we ever get dragged into a bigger war. Okay. Brings me to... Uh... My final question, and I've got to ask you this, uh, uh, you and I have spoken over the years a number of times, you know that a lot of our readers are, are very keen on many things that uh, you have to say. 
and they've told us they'd love to see you back in government. Now, I, I appreciate there hasn't been any sort of offer and you, you may not be able to say too much, but if called upon, if called upon by the new prime minister, whoever that may be, Liz Truss or Rishi Sunak, would you consider a role back in government again? Of course I would. Um, but as you say, it's for others to make that decision and make that offer. But I've always said that I'm very happy to help Conservative government in any sensible way. If, if they think I've got a contribution to make and if I think the job they are suggesting is one I could actually do, I'd be very happy to help. Which sort of areas would you particularly be interested in? Oh, I, I, I don't want to set out a prospectus. <laughs> I think that would be quite wrong. The minister is interested. She will have advisors who say, well, John might be able to do this and then we can talk. Yeah. Uh, so, John, you've given us a fascinating tour d'horizon, as they say in France, of our political future and, and some of the possibilities, the positives and the negatives. So on behalf of CIBUK.org, FactsFreeEU.org, and our wider audience, I'd like to thank you uh, for sharing all of that with us today. Well, thank you very much for an interesting conversation.